Well, for those of you who don't know, I had a date with a deer, and uh, he kind of wrecked my motorcycle, but I'm still here, so I'm thanking God. Amen. God is good. Amen. I guess even at 52, we can bounce a little, so. But I was able to walk to the ambulance and, and leave, the, um, leave the hospital that same day, so. God's good, and I had a word from the Lord, and so I'm not going to let anything stop me from bringing it to you today. So let's get our Bibles out, and children can be dismissed if they're still here. Turn to Luke 22, starting in verse 47. I think this is... My first sit-down message. As long as I have both hands, an Italian can speak. Luke 22, starting in verse 47, we're going to look at a very interesting miracle today where Jesus heals the ear of the high priest's servant after Peter chops it off. Father, we just thank you for the miracles and we thank you for the worship today as we're reveling in the fact that we believe that you can do what your word says you can do. God, we believe in healing. We believe in raising the dead. We believe that you heal the sick, that cancer has to bow the knee. Father, we believe all of that. So we ask you to manifest those things in and through us and in this house. We ask it in Jesus' name. Father, as we study this miracle, I pray today that the Holy Spirit would illuminate our understanding that we would be able to get the principles extracted out of here that will challenge us to trust you more and to have more faith. And I ask this in Jesus' name, and the church said, amen. Amen. Well, Luke 22, I'm going to start in verse 47 uh, and read through verse 53. This whole entire miracle really takes place in one verse, but the rest is set up, and there's there's a lot of things happening here. So pay attention. As, uh, as the word goes forth. Verse 47 of Luke 22. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, of, who was one of the twelve, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said to them, Permit even this, or stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers who had come against him, Have you come with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this hour and the power of darkness are yours. Now, as I said, the miracle takes place all in one verse, in verse 51. But Jesus answered and said, stop, no more of this, or permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now, this is one of the healing miracles as we're in this series that demonstrates perhaps the most outlandish display of God's mercy and grace. And here's why. Because Jesus is about to heal an adversary. He's about to heal someone who comes to him in an adversarial way. These guys were not playing around. They came with swords and clubs and spears. They were going to take Jesus away, and they didn't just want to have a stern chat with him. They were planning to kill him, and they were planning to come up with any excuse to do that. So here Jesus heals an adversary, and I want you to understand something. This man didn't come to him with a shred of faith. He didn't come thinking, oh, this is Jesus, you know, and I think he's God's son, and, you know, I bet he could heal me in case somebody chops my ear off. No, not a shred of faith. In fact, he didn't even ask Jesus to heal him. He didn't get hurt and then go, Jesus, please heal me. No, he didn't ask for a miracle. He didn't come with any faith, and he came in an adversarial way. And what I want you to see here is that Jesus can do miracles when all those components are missing. You and I many times think, well, we've got to do this, and we've got to do that, and we've got to have unshakable faith, and we can't have a shred of doubt, and we, we've got to ask in just the right way. How many Christians think, you know, you need, to put, you need to construct the perfect prayer together to get God motivated to heal you? This guy didn't even ask. 
Yet here Jesus comes and he touches him and he heals him completely and restores an ear that was just taken off. He's an adversary. He comes with no faith and he doesn't even ask. This miracle becomes an amazing display of God's mercy and grace that God would just do this for a person who didn't have any of the right components in place. And that should stir our faith this morning, amen, to believe that even if we don't, you know, have all the right attitudes and the right theology and the right prayers, that God can move on our behalf in a powerful way. Now, this miracle is going to test us, and I'll tell you why. Because it's going to test to see if we really believe in extending God's mercy and grace to everyone. You might look at this guy and go, no, he was on the wrong team. He got what he deserved. Yet, you know, we have to understand that Jesus even heals people who have the wrong attitude, who have the wrong heart. He heals people who deserve it, and he heals people who don't deserve it. Hello? And, and really the truth is that none of us deserve a touch from God. No, well, pastor, I believe all the right things, and I come to church twice a week, and you know, I'm X, Y, and Z, and here's your spiritual pedigree. Still, none of us deserve miracles. Who can, who can pound the desk and say, you owe me a miracle, God? Ha, none of us can. Yeah, here's a man, no faith, no expectation, comes in the wrong way, and he's healed. So it's going to test us to see if we really believe that everybody can experience the grace of God, that the grace of God is for everyone. Now, the backdrop for this miracle is interesting. I always look at what's going on around Jesus. Sometimes he's arguing with uh, religious people. Sometimes, you know, there's crowds and there's professional mourners. There's always something going on in the background. Now, the backdrop for this miracle is one of open hostility and betrayal. They, they got a mob here. They're an armed mob, and they've come to snatch up Jesus, okay? That's open hostility. If you think that's not a, you know, an anxious situation, you're just kidding yourself. If, you know, this afternoon, 15 police cars showed up at your house with a SWAT team, and they came through the front door, and they called out for your name. Come on, let it touch you a little bit. You know... It's a, it's a serious moment for the disciples. It's even a, a, an anxious moment for Jesus. We know he was agonizing in the garden here because he knows what is about to happen. There's open hostility. Uh, they're done talking with Jesus. They're done trying to trip him up. They're done trying to catch him in doctrinal nuances. Now they've got swords and clubs, pitchforks and torches, and they show up to take him away. Also, you know, the backdrop is one of betrayal. Uh, you know, Judas comes, one of the 12, one of Jesus' own, leads the mob. He leads them to him. He's about to identify who he is with a kiss. And so you have the hostility as if that's not bad enough. But then you have betrayal. How many people have ever been betrayed? Well, was it a good experience? Did you enjoy it? No, nobody enjoys betrayal. It's the worst of human experiences. Yet that's the backdrop for this miracle here. You know, and it seems like... Everything is climaxing for Jesus at this point. Prophecy is being fulfilled. But, you know, he's in the garden. He's passionately praying. It's probably the one time he needs his disciples, and what are they doing? Falling asleep. You know, many times God doesn't need us, but he takes us along for the ride. At this moment, Jesus, in being fully man and fully God, he, he needed those guys around him. He took them with him. He wanted their support but they're falling asleep, so he's got to be anxious about that. You know, he's in the garden. He's passionately praying. He knows what he's about to face. His disciples are continually letting him down, and here comes Judas with the armed mob to kiss him and betray him. Now, you might think uh, Jesus is having a real bad day here. Does that sound like a bad day for Jesus? And the truth is all of us have had bad days, amen? Do you ever just wake up some days and think, I better get back in bed and start over? Come on, second service, you're half dead out there. Do I have to stand up and jump up and down? Come on, come on. Wake up a little bit on me. Turn the air conditioning up if you got to. I'm a little crotchety. I'm in pain, so, you know, a little amen here. He's having a bad day. His disciples are letting him down. He's about to face the cross. He knows the physical pain. He knows the torment. You know, and all of us have had bad days. There's some days where so many things go wrong in a row that you just have to laugh. Anybody ever been there? 
You know, there was a woman who came home to find her husband in the kitchen, shaking violently, and she noticed the wire coming off of his waist towards the electric socket. Thinking he was being electrocuted, she ran to the garage and grabbed a two-by-four off his workbench. She hit him so hard in an attempt to loose him from the deadly current that she broke his arm in two places and knocked him to the ground unconscious. Up to that point, he had been listening to his iPod. Man, there... Uh, all of us have days like that. You know, he was, you're just minding your own business and deer are flying out of the woods coming at you. And Jesus is having one of those days where it's all coming to a climax here for him. And Judas leads the procession, so it's hostility and it's betrayal. Now, verse 47 and 48 captures the moment of Judas's betrayal. It, you know, and it's, it's pretty stark here. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came and the one called Judas. So one of the 12, one of Jesus' own. And as he proceeding, he approached Jesus and went to kiss him. Notice in verse 48, Jesus doesn't, doesn't let him get his kiss off till he confronts him. He's like, he said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Like one last attempt to wake him up from the folly of what he's doing. Yet Judas is on a mission. He's He's on a mission to complete his destiny because his heart has been corrupt from the beginning. So here's this moment where Judas betrays him. Now, betrayal hurts so much, not just because somebody, you know, uh, you know, short circuits you or undercuts you or undermines you. Betrayal hurts so much because, you know, it's usually that our betrayers are those who are close to us. In fact, it couldn't really even be betrayal if it's not a, a person who's close enough to betray you. You know, in a business deal that goes sour or a legal issue or some kind of, you know, some kind of conflict between people. And you don't know the person, but you don't expect too much from a person you don't know. They're going to act on their own best interest and they're going to come against you. But a friend, a brother, someone close to you, a family member, when they, you know, do what Jesus did, that, that's betrayal. And it stings on a level that is hard, you know, it's hard to top that. Here comes Judas and He's the one who, you know, was with Jesus, one of the 12, and he saw Jesus every day. He ate with him. You know, something happens when you eat with people, when you sleep next to them. There's a bonding that takes place. Uh, he, he saw all the miracles. J Judas was there for the miracles. He saw the withered hands extend. He saw the lame legs receive strength. He saw the kingdom of God touch earth in a way like it never had. He knew Jesus was innocent. In fact, later on, he tells the high priest, I have betrayed innocent blood. And their response is, well, what is that to us? He knew Jesus was blameless and perfect. Yet Judas loved money and his motives were corrupt from the beginning. So he agrees to hand Jesus over for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, you know, the person who should have had Jesus' back, the person who carried the money purse, the person who should have stood up for him instead of having his back, he sticks a knife in his back. Now, perhaps the second worst act of betrayal in history, apart from Judas betraying Jesus, is the betrayal of Ju Julius Caesar. No treachery is worse than being betrayed by a family member or a very close friend. Julius Caesar knew such betrayal because among the conspirators who killed the Roman leader on March 15, 44 BC, was Marcus Junius Brutus. Caesar not only trusted Brutus, he loved Brutus. He favored him as a son. According to Roman historians, Caesar first resisted the onslaught of assassins who attacked him, but when he saw Brutus among them with his dagger drawn, Caesar stopped struggling. He took the top of his robe and pulled it over his face, and he said this famous question, E tu, Brute? You see, betrayal is a hard thing to deal with. And if you've been betrayed by someone who's close to you, you know the sting of it. Jesus is feeling that in a powerful way here. And, you know, that's the backdrop of a miracle. You would think, is Jesus obligated to heal people in the midst of one of the, the, the hardest moments of his existence? He knows he's about to be separated from the Father. He knows he's about to be nailed to a cross. He knows all of these things, yet he takes the time to heal someone in the middle of it. There's nobody like Jesus. None of the re remaining 11 disciples saw it coming. Yet in verse 47, here comes Judas. 
and he points out Jesus, and Jesus calls him out on it, and so all of this is happening very quick. Now, verse 49 is a very anxious moment for the disciples. And look at this. It says, when those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Now, I want you to pick up on that. Those who were around him, who is that? The, the eleven when they saw what was going to happen. This is a moment for the disciples where the light finally comes on. They finally saw. Jesus had been telling them, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be executed. I'm going to rise on the third day. I'm going to be betrayed. The son of, over and over again, he told them, and it was almost cryptic to them. They couldn't, what is he talking about? No one's going to, no, and they just didn't get it. And they were even too scared to ask him questions about it because they didn't get it. Yet at this moment, now they get it. And the light comes on. Have you ever had moments like that in your life when the light comes on and all the things that were obscure to you or that were in the shadows become vividly apparent? They saw what was going on. And finally, all the cryptic things that Jesus said to them finally, suddenly, in that instant, made sense. They're going to take him, they're going to arrest him, and they're going to kill him. An anxious moment for the disciples. If any of us have ever been in crisis, if you've ever been in these moments, you know, you know your adrenaline is going, your heart is racing, there's confusion there. And you see this confusion in the, in the disciples because they, they see what's going on, but they don't know what to do. So they ask Jesus, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Jesus, is it time to defend you? Should we, should we let them take you? So they ask this question, and we're going to talk about the sword, and we're going to talk about, you know, why they were there, and, and, and are Christians permitted to defend themselves? We're going to talk about all these things. But before Jesus could answer the question, someone takes a swing, and I'll give you one guess who it is. It's Pete. Pete's always out of control. Pete's always impetuous. You know, the disciples say, shall we strike with the sword? And Peter's already swinging. He's like, you got to love Peter. You know, I mean, what a, what a great thing. Here's a great example. When it's time to take action, we should always ask Jesus, you know, what should we do? They're confused. It's an anxious moment. But Peter's brash. He's impulsive. He has zeal and he's clueless. You got to say something about Peter, though. Even though in his brashness and in his impulsiveness, he, he had guts and he had passion. And whether you, you like it or not, those are two good things, amen? We need people with guts these days to stand up and defend the gospel, defend the truth, defend what Jesus said. We need people of integrity, you know, who, who will just do... Not just stop at words, but, but take action. So Peter is that guy. You know, he's the only one who got out of the boat to walk on the water. The rest of them are all spectators. Yeah, he had a little, you know, he sunk a little bit, but, you know, he got out of the boat. You know, faith takes risk. Faith takes guts. Peter was willing to defend Jesus at that moment, and there's some merit to that. But listen to me. Uh, there was something also out of line about that because, you know, it, it wasn't time to defend Jesus in that way. And Peter, once again, in his zeal, without knowledge, he kind of misses it here. Uh, it wasn't time to pull the sword and try and resist this because it was Jesus' destiny to go to the cross, and Jesus willingly would go. Now, before we say something too much about Peter's swordsmanship, and, you know, like Peter, you know, you need to practice with that thing a little bit because, you know, ear is not a lethal. Just realize a few inches towards the center of the head, and Jesus would have to raise the dead instead of heal this ear. So Peter was serious, and it was a serious moment. It was a serious assault uh, on the, you know, temple guard there. And the situation had the ability to escalate. Now there's a problem. Why? Because we have a wounded aggressor here, and this guy is part of the mob and he was looking to kill Jesus. And so you might say, well, you know, they came. They, this guy was part of that group. So he got, what he, would, he got what he deserved. You know, and our flesh would think that. If somebody attacks us, somebody tries to hurt us, and, and they get taken out, well, then they got what they deserved. Amen? The deer got what it deserved on Friday. The troopers sent it to sleep. 
And our flesh thinks that way. Well, you know, here's somebody did this to me and did that to me. Well, you know, they, they got what they deserved. And Jesus' response is much different here. Why? Because he knows what's going on. He knows what his destiny is. Jesus in 51, where, where the whole miracle is contained, Jesus answered and said, he answered and said, so obviously there was some back and forth going on. This guy's holding what used to be left of his ear. Jesus says, permit even this or enough of this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. So I want to ask you, who is Jesus talking to when he says, permit even this? Is he talking to his disciples or the mob? Is he saying to his disciples, let him take me, permit it? Or is he saying to the mob, permit even this? You know, I'm sorry for this outburst here from my uh, esteemed colleague, Peter, but let's not escalate this. Really, he's talking to the mob. And Jesus is saying, permit even this. What he's saying is that, you know... He's, he's trying to defuse the mob here. Why? Because Peter just started a fight for the disciples that they couldn't win. Are you live out there? You know, we, we, we read through this so quickly and we think, you know, oh, well, that's just the way it rolled out. But listen, when you attack the temple guard, these were trained soldiers. They were trained to protect. They had the right weaponry. They had the right, right training. You had a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors, and, and these guys had no, they were about to get wiped out. If this thing escalated, the disciples would be destroyed. So Jesus steps in and he says, permit even this, what he's doing here is he's asking them to forgive the offense and not escalate the situation. Jesus was asking the authorities to overlook Peter's aggression to save the disciples from what they had just started. Now, Christians can defend themselves, amen? All right, that was too weak. Let me try this again. Christians can defend themselves, And you know what? We need to. We need to not be pacifists and step back. There is wickedness and evil in the world. And by us stepping back, especially men, men, protect your children, protect your wives, protect your families, amen? (laughs) Christians are supposed to defend the innocent. And there's a time for self-defense. The Bible builds clear cases for that. Uh, But, you know... We're not commanded to be pacifists. And I want to maybe shock you a little bit and and tell you why those swords were there. Why did the disciples have swords? Well, Jesus actually told them to bring swords in Luke 22. So you're looking at me like I'm making this up. So let's go to the videotape. Luke 22, 36 through 38. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack or a purse or whatever, uh, hopefully it wasn't a man bag, and he, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. So Jesus was saying, yeah, I'm going to be in some kind of conflict here, and if you don't have a sword, sell your coat and buy one. Basically what he's telling them is there's going to be trouble, and guys, when I'm gone, I've been here to defend you all this time. When I'm gone, you're going to have to defend yourselves. And so he tells them, sell your coat if you don't have a sword and buy one. And then it continues here in verse 38. So they said, look, Uh, Lord, look, there are two swords. And he said to him, it is enough. So he lets them take the swords. He doesn't tell them not to touch the swords. He doesn't tell them not to bring the swords. He says, sell your coke, sell your cloak. I must be thirsty here. Let me just take a drink. Sell your cloak and buy one if you don't have one. So here's two. Jesus said, that's enough. Um, Notice who got the sword. Peter seemed to get himself a sword. Should have had a sword permit. I don't know if he needed a sword, but... So Jesus allows them to bring the sword to the game. Uh, But, uh, you know, what happens here, this is not the time to defend Jesus. Jesus doesn't need defense at this point. And so uh, I have to ask myself, what's Peter's end game here? What does Peter think he's going to do against this armed mob mob here? How many ears is he going to have to cut off before they quit? You know, what's his end game here? Is he gonna, is he gonna just go, you know, uh, I'm gonna beat off this crowd here. I'm gonna take Jesus. We're gonna go into hiding and I'm gonna just, you know, we're gonna run around and hide and we'll stay on. No, you know, you gotta understand something here. There's no 
end game for Peter in this situation. He, Jesus has to go to the cross. In fact, if Jesus doesn't go to the cross in this moment, all of us, including Peter, are going to remain lost in our sins. So there's a time and a place for everything. Sometimes we need to look at Ecclesiastes and realize that. But this is not the time and it's not the place. And I wonder what Peter's endgame is here because it doesn't make any sense. And so uh, the situation is spiraling into chaos it's about to get a lot worse than it needs to be. Uh, you know, the aggressors here uh, are about to escalate the situation. And what does Jesus do? He comes in and he diffuses the whole thing. He asks him, permit this, meaning like overlook what just happened. And then he slips his hands onto that man's head and he heals that ear. Now, what a moment that is. At one point when Jesus, they ask if he was Jesus, he says, I am, and the crowd gets blown back. Remember that? Scripture tells us about that. So the, the, the presence of God, I am, he's basically saying, uh, yeah, I'm here, I'm God, and they get kind of blown back. Now he heals this guy's ear. It's lopped off, it's bleeding, he's in pain. And I can just picture Jesus slipping his hands around his neck, coming up on his ears, and just you know healing him, and that ear is healed. What an amazing moment here. You think it would be enough to diffuse the mob to get them to just, you know, drop what they were doing, but it's not. But Jesus diffuses the situation and he preserves his disciples so that they can live to do what they're supposed to do. They had a destiny like he had a destiny. A lot of moving parts here. I want to I want to finish this message by giving you three not so obvious lessons that we learn from this miracle. And the first one is this. Many times Jesus has to protect us from ourselves. <laughs> you think, what's God doing in my life? He's protecting me from me. <laughs> you know, many times we think our problems come from other people. Or they come from our work situation or they come from our socioeconomic background. They come from our skin color. The truth is the, our problems come from the person who looks back at us in the mirror every morning. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And those of you who aren't clapping are making me nervous because you're your biggest problem and you don't know it. It's not everybody else. It's me. It's my poor choices. It's my poor decisions. It's amazing. Everybody these days wants to blame everything on everybody else. But it's us. Understand something here today. What, what's going on here, people? I'm falling off the cliff. Understand here something. Peter's problem was Peter, and Jesus was going to take care of that. But we are getting protected from our own bad decisions, our own miscalculations, our own you know, decisions that we make that just set us on a trajectory that's not good. So Jesus has to come, and he has to protect Peter and the disciples from this rash, impulsive action. Lord, what should we do? Peter's already swinging. Now we got a little mess going on here. So God protects us from ourselves. And notice there's times where things are happening in our life. God's moving people around. He's dealing with people. He's ordering our steps. And there are many times we don't even know what he's doing. And in our impetuousness, we're like, God, you're not doing anything. And you know what? I don't know if God rolls his eyes, but that would probably be a good place to roll your eyes. God, you're not doing anything. I'm doing all this praying. And he's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. All the things he set in order, all the things he set in place, all the times he protected us, all the prayers we prayed that he didn't answer. <laughs> Have you ever stopped to be thankful for unanswered prayers? Oh, God, give me this. Oh, God, let me have this job. Oh, God, let me marry that person. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that, you know, he doesn't answer all of our prayers. We need to learn to thank God for our unanswered prayers. We need to thank God for the times he protects us that we don't even know it. And the times he protects us from ourselves, our rash, impulsive actions, our rash, impulsive attitudes usually make things worse for us. Remember, uh, self-control is a fruit of the spirit. A person who has control of themselves is not weak. They're stronger than you know. A strong person who becomes violent and has no control of themselves is a weak person. But a strong person who can control that is the strongest of the strong. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Discernment is a spiritual gift. 
I'm not being hard on Peter or judgmental, but I would venture to say that his discernment in this situation was a little bit off by a few degrees. Impulsiveness, anger, and rage are works of the flesh. I want you to listen to a scripture here. Look, there's a time to be angry. There's a time to fight. There's a time to stand up. But listen, our, our reaching for the sword should be our last resort. It should not be our first impulse. Our anger should be the last resort. So, some people who have anger problems think that all their anger is righteous indignation. And really, righteous indignation is the only proper application of anger. When Jesus was flipping over tables and whipping people, and remember that scene in, in, the, in the synagogue, right? That was righteous indignation. It wasn't that Jesus' blood sugar was low and he needed a Snickers. No, he was genuinely angry that they turned his father's house, which should be a house of prayer, into a den of thieves. So that was righteous indignation, but... Anger and rage and, and, and impulsive, these things, you know, when, when it's not righteous, when it's the flesh, it's a big problem, and it makes more problems for us than, you know, it solves issues. Listen to James 1, 19 through 20. This is a powerful text. If you're taking notes, copy this down, and I want you to commit this to memory. Listen to what James 1, 19 says. You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now everyone must be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let's just take the first part there. Listen to that. Everyone was quick to hear. We have two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we talk. Ladies, you should listen twice as much as you talk. I know you have 50,000 words a day, and men have, what, 20 grunts and 30 words? Is that what it is? But listen more than you talk. And some of you are not even listening to me right now. Slow to speak. Sometimes just listen. Oh, it's my turn to speak. Good. Here's my rebuttal. Amen. I wonder who's taking him home. So here we go. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Guys, this is a real good one for us, right? What's the thing? We want to we wanna just you know, fly off the handle into a rage, right? Don't look so innocent out there but we've got to be slow to anger. Remember, we need to keep that under control. Now, verse 20 is so powerful. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. Oh, well, you know, I, I let them sinners have it. I let them know, you know, the, what the Bible says about them, and they're going to hell, boy. Yeah, and, and who did you lead to Christ that day? You just drove them further away. Why? Because... The anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. You, we're not going to get it in the rage, in, in the anger, in the fits of the flesh, in the, in the vocal, uh, you know, uh, rebuttals. That's not where it is. It's in love. So Peter's response here is in the flesh. It's impulsive. And many times we're the same way. And what does Jesus do? He steps in and he protects us from ourselves. And we need to be thankful for that. Number two, the second not-so-obvious lesson from this miracle is this. We must be willing to see our enemies healed. Now, if you're out there saying, oh, I don't have any enemies, you are an idiot. I hope that's on record there. Because all of us have enemies. And if, even if everybody likes you, some people are smiling at you, but they're not for you. All of us have enemies, even if everybody at some moment in time actually was happy with us, we have a kingdom of darkness that is hell-bent on destroying our faith and dragging our souls into hell. All of us have enemies. We have spiritual enemies. We have natural enemies. Hey, you got neighbors that can't stand you. They talk about you all the time at dinner. And they're not for you. So all of us have enemies, and we need to know that. But we need to have a, a heart towards our enemies like Jesus had. He heals this man who's an adversary. Yet, you know, 
When we see those who have acted wickedly against us, we see those who spoke about us behind our backs, who exposed us maybe to our bosses, who, who reported us you know, uh, uh, to the police or, 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 or something about our property to the homeowners association, those people who you know, are trying to get us in trouble, those people who are spreading gossip about us. And when we see those people get waylaid by life, there's a part of our flesh that goes, good, it's about time. And there again, you can look as holy as you want, but I can see right through it because you're just like me. Amen? That person who mistreated you in high school, man, I, I, I still see, you know, and you see them on Facebook and when the years haven't been kind to you. And there's a part of you like, good. The wages of sin is fat, apparently. I better take more Advil. But you know it. You know, you go to the high school reunion and all. Just, just take a moment, fill in your blanks. But there's a part of us, oh, good for you, Well, It's about time. Well, you deserved it. You know, and there's been times where, you know, people who had mistreated me, people who had started fights with me at school and stuff, and I see stuff happen. And you know what? There's a part of me that, that wants to go good. But did you ever have a thought enter your head that was so counterproductive you had to shake your head? Anybody, if you see me driving down the street going like this, yeah, I'm trying to get that thought out of my head because I know if I entertain that and allow myself to revel in someone else's situation that's bad, I'm, I'm sowing something into my future that's not healthy. So you and I have to leave room, leave space, leave grace to, to be willing to see our enemies healed. Do you know Jonah the prophet? His issue was not that he couldn't hear God. He heard God. God said, go to the Ninevites and preach to them. And, you know, and then your message, you know, and I'm going to bring repentance. And Jonah was filling in the pieces. And Jonah could hear God, but he couldn't stomach the fact that God would allow the Ninevites to repent and that he would pour out mercy upon them. That's why Jonah fleed, and, and he went in the opposite direction, and he had to go, you know, get in a fish and take the first air-conditioned submarine ride and all that stuff. That's why, not because he couldn't hear God, not because he was unable to be obedient, because he couldn't stomach the fact that God would have mercy and bring salvation to the Ninevites. Think about that, and think about how easy it is for us to not, oh man, this group and that, they persecuted the church, they've martyred the saints. You know, we got groups running around chopping people's heads off and crucifying Christians. And, you know, if you go on the Voice of the Martyrs website and you see what, what happens to the church, how it's being persecuted, you would think, God, judge them. But really, our hearts should be, God, save them. Because as Jesus said, they know not what they do. So we've got to be willing to have mercy on our enemies. Do you know God has always used sinners to do his work in the kingdom of God? I've studied this thing top to bottom, inside out, backwards and forwards, in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and I can't find any place in here where God used a perfect person. So that's good news for us, first of all. Second of all, understand this, that we're all sinners and we all deserve judgment. So while we're hoping that God judges others, we're really attracting judgment to our own lives because all of us have sin to deal with. <laughs> Romans 5.10 tells us that at one time, all of us were actually enemies of God. Listen to this, Romans 5.10. For if while we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death, the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So all of us, when we were in sin, were in a situation where we were enemies with God. We were contrary to him. Why? Because he was holy and we were in sin. Yet the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So all of us were enemies of God. All of us deal with sin. None of us deserve grace. I want to encourage you today, Christian, don't think that, you know, you've walked so close with God and gotten so holy that now you deserve grace. It's amazing how quickly we forget what we've come from. You know, when we get to that place, we're in danger of being sucked back into it just so we can get a little humility back into our lives. 
man, I am a sinner saved by grace. I need his grace more and more every day. And there is nobody that is beyond the reach of God's grace. So you and I have to entertain the possibility that even those who are in the worst situations and cases, that God could reach in and save them. It's like the song we sung this morning. Look, Moses was a murderer. Samson was an immoral womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Noah was drunk and naked. Jacob was a conniving cheater. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Peter denied Jesus three times. The disciples all fled from Jesus. Paul persecuted, terrorized, and martyred Christians. And yet God used all of them amazingly. Could you imagine if somebody took out Paul before he could become you know, the greatest apostle that ever lived. Could you imagine if somebody put David to death because of his sin where God extended grace and became the greatest king in Israel's history, the one that the Messiah came through his lineage? Grace, it's grace, it's grace. You and I need to be people of grace to entertain the fact that God could be gracious even to those who don't deserve it because we think we do and we don't deserve it either. I want to close with this one last point, and it's maybe not the biggest one. It's only going to take two hours, but it's it's a lesson that's not so obvious. But bodily healing always heals more than bodies. Just ruminate on that one for a second. You see, if Jesus heals your body, he's not just healed a part of you that's going to go back to the dust and that's it. He's healed a whole lot more than your body. There's nobody who gets a healing. There's no one who gets a healing from cancer, from, you know, some disease, from a, some blood disorder. There's no one who gets healed of that that doesn't have other things healed in them besides just their body. <laughs> when Jesus touched a man with a withered hand and his hand was extended, so much more was healed than just a hand. When lepers were made clean, so much more was healed than just skin being made clean. You see... There are things in us that need to be healed so much more than our bodies. These bodies are temporary, yet we're so excited. Oh, my flesh, my body, everything's working. Woo, I feel like I hit the fountain of youth. Amen. That thing's going into the dirt. It's going to turn back into dust. You've got a soul and a spirit that's going to live for eternity. Our minds need to be healed, church. Our minds need to be healed. Our minds are beat up. Our thinking is wrong. Our theology gets messed up sometimes. Our view of God is twisted. Oh, he's mad at me. He's cut me off. He's, you know, the promises are for everybody but me. What's that? That's a mind that needs to be healed. Our emotions need to be healed. Our broken hearts need to be healed. Have you ever had a heart that's broken? I've had a broken heart. You've had a broken heart. Disappointments in life. And what does it do? It colors and filters and clouds everything around us because our heart is damaged. Out of the heart come the issues of life. If my heart is broken, if my emotions are broken, if I think God is against me and he's not for me and he's mad at me and he's punishing me all the time, our faith needs to be healed. Too many of us have given up on, well, God doesn't seem to hear my prayer. God didn't do this, and I asked him to. Or God doesn't heal anymore. God doesn't set captives free. Or there's no hope for a person who's stuck in this. Or there's no hope for a person who's, you know, given over. And, and, and then our faith and our hope gets damaged to the point where we don't know what we can believe God for. And that needs to be healed. Our ability to love others needs to be healed. Has life been rough on you? Have you been beat up by people? And on the other side of the coin, Jesus says, love them. Hmm. You know, Jesus' healing touch on that man that day, I guarantee you this, we don't know his name, we don't know what happened to him, but I guarantee you he was never the same after Jesus touched him. Jesus' healing touch will change your life. And you and I need to realize there's so much more to healing than just bodily healing. We need God to heal our world, to heal the nations, to heal the church, to heal Christian individuals, to heal marriages, to heal children, to heal families. Bodily healing always brings more than just a healed body. That man was never the same again. We must leave room in our hearts for grace to extend to our enemies And we have to realize most of the time, God is protecting us from ourselves. 
and be thankful that he is. Let's bow our heads today. Father, I just thank you for this miracle. I thank you that you protected your disciples. You kept the situation from escalating uh, through their actions that went in a direction that would have been destructive for them. But God, you preserve us even in our missteps and our mistakes, even when we act out in the flesh. Holy Spirit, you go before us and order our steps. Help us to realize we're sinners saved by grace and that it's not impossible for God even to reach the worst of sinners, but to believe that God would have mercy and grant repentance to those who are enemies of righteousness. And God, help us to look for the miraculous for more than just bodies being healed, but to reach out to you to heal every part of us, mind, soul, spirit, body, every part because that's what you purchased for us on the cross at Calvary. And we want to avail ourselves of it. In Jesus' name, amen.